Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you again today. Welcome to Worship and the Word with us here at Church of the True Vine. I'm going to begin this morning by reading the words of Psalm 105. I'm just reading the first three verses this morning. They say, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. We have come together today to seek the Lord. We come together today to declare his praise. We come together today to declare the greatness of our God, our God, the maker of heaven and earth, who still loves us as individuals so much that Jesus laid down his life for each and every one of us. What a wonderful, wonderful God we serve. Jesus is everything. We're going to be worshipping him together in a little while. We're going to be singing that great Keith Green classic, There is a Redeemer. And we're also going to be praying together today. We're praying today for India. We prayed for India last week, but we keep praying for India. India, as you know, is in the grip of this second wave of COVID. The death toll is horrific and what's going on there is awful. And India needs a miracle. So please join with us as we continue to pray for the nation of India today. But as you know, we also pray every week for a country in the world where persecution against Christians is fierce. And today we're praying for a country which probably many people have never even heard of. And that is the nation of Mauritania. Mauritania is a strongly Islamic country. There are around about 10,000, 11,000 Christians in that nation, around about 0.2% of the population. And it is very, very difficult to be a Christian in that nation. It is illegal in that nation to convert from Islam. So preaching the gospel, declaring the truth of what Jesus has done and who Jesus is, declaring that Jesus is the one true Lord uh, is, is a very dangerous thing to do. Also, if somebody becomes uh, a Christian, they will be rejected by their families. They will be, they will lose social status and it's very, very difficult for them. It's impossible for Christians to meet openly and it's pretty much impossible for Christians to perform baptisms or for somebody to conduct a Christian marriage or a Christian burial. So it is very, very difficult for Christians in Mauritania. So please join with us today as we pray for India and also as we pray for our fellow believers in Mauritania. But as I said, we're going to begin today by singing that great song by Keith Green. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Join with us. Lift up your heart to heaven. Lift up your voice and declare this wonderful truth. There is a Redeemer. His name is Jesus. God bless you.
Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for the beautiful world you created and for the joy of the springtime with all its new life. But above all, we thank you that you love and care for us and that you sent your son to die so that we may live and worship you forever. You have said in your word that we will find you when we seek you with our whole heart. So at this time of Ramadan, we pray for all those seeking the truth, that they may find salvation in the true and the living God. We pray for peace in our sin-sick world, and also that you will have mercy on those still fighting major outbreaks of COVID. We thank you for the vaccinations and all those working on cures and preventatives, and pray that you will bless their work. We pray that the vaccines will be able to be rolled out worldwide and that those countries like India, where the situation is grave, will not only get sufficient aid from other nations, but will also be able to put it into the hands of those who need it, need it most. Please meet the needs of Christians who are faced with added hostility and injustice and give them all that they need. We pray that you will bless and direct our government and that they will rule with wisdom and justice, and be seen to be upright and honest in all their dealings. We bring before you all those who have been elected in this week's round of voting, and we do pray that you will equip them for the task and give them wisdom and joy in serving their communities. We pray for Christians in Mauritania, where it is impossible for them to gather together for worship openly. Especially we pray for those who have converted from Islam, and find themselves turned into criminals and at terrible personal risk. Please strengthen them and give them the joy of your presence and the courage to stand up for you no matter what they are facing. Please cause this government to change the cruel and inhumane policy and respect the decision of those who decide to follow you. Make it possible for believers to share their faith openly and safely and live without fear. We pray for the UK as we emerge from this wave of the pandemic that people will continue to take care and consider others who may be more worried than they are. We also pray for all our businesses which have suffered such setbacks that their recovery may be speedy and permanent and that they may be able to create new employment opportunities for those who need them. We pray for the Church, your body, here on earth. Lord, open our ears to hear what you are saying to the nations and our eyes to see what you are calling us to do. May the Gospel message be fearlessly proclaimed in our land and may everyone have the opportunity to hear it. Raise up a new generation of believers who will impact the entire life of this nation. Lord, forgive our sin and heal our land. Thank you, Lord, that you always hear and answer our prayers, and that if we pray within your will, the answer will always be yes. Teach us to discern your will, and keep trusting whenever we are tempted to doubt. We rejoice that, although we often let you down, you will never desert us, and we will always give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, starting at verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places and they came to him 
from every direction. I love this account in Mark's Gospel of this leper coming to Jesus and being cleansed of his leprosy. Anyone who knows me and anyone who's known me for any length of time will know that I would say if I had a favourite passage of scripture, you're probably not allowed to have a favourite passage of scripture, but if you were, then this would probably be mine. This account of this leper, this wretched man coming to Jesus and being cleansed of his leprosy. Why do I love it so much? Well, I love it so much because for me, this encapsulates the gospel. Somehow to me, this just sums up the beauty of the gospel. It demonstrates the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ and his authority and his power to turn any life around. Let's just begin in verse 40. It says, now a leper came to him. In those days in Israel, leprosy was effectively a death sentence. Nowadays, we are, we are blessed to have medicines, we are blessed to have treatments which can cure leprosy. And so for people who contract leprosy these days, it is not such a feared thing as it was then, although it's still a terrible, terrible disease. But in those days, leprosy was feared, feared greatly. And if somebody contracted leprosy, leprosy was considered a condition so serious, so contagious, that if anyone came into contact with somebody who had been diagnosed with leprosy, then the person who touched them would themselves become a leper. And so lepers were excluded from society. They were cast out of their dwelling place. Many of them would huddle together in leper colonies and they would rely on the the love the compassion of somebody maybe a relative maybe a friend to come and drop food at a distance from the colony and uh, leave food there for them from a safe distance and then they would disappear when the lepers came out to collect the food lepers were not allowed anywhere near society and if a leper came anywhere near where other human beings were this was really taking their life in their own hands. Lepers were told that if they, if they came anywhere where people were, they would have to shout unclean, unclean, so that anyone who didn't have leprosy could get out of their way. But those people who didn't have leprosy would think it was quite okay to pick up rocks and stone that leper and kill that leper rather than having leprosy come into their village or their town or wherever they were. So this leper coming to where Jesus is, is effectively taking his life into his own hands. This is a leper. This is one who is unclean, excluded from society, but also excluded from the worship of God at the temple. So he is doubly excluded, excluded from human contact, but also excluded from approaching God. And this leper takes his life into his own hands as he approaches Jesus. This is a desperate man, but this is a man who somehow has heard about Jesus. We don't know how he's heard. Maybe a relative has left a note with some of the food that he's left for him. Maybe a, a friend has shouted it to him from a distance, but he has declared to him, Jesus is around. And this leper has heard of what Jesus has been doing as he has come into the area. And he has heard what is reported just a few verses before in this chapter, where it says in verse 32, at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Somehow word has got to this leper that Jesus is in town and that Jesus heals the sick and Jesus sets those free who are bound by demons. You can almost feel that hope rising in the leper's heart as he hears this word and as he sets out to try to find Jesus. And yet, 
from what the leper says to Jesus, we see this nagging uncertainty in his heart. And it's an uncertainty, it's a nagging doubt, it's a fear that many people have in the world today. Because what this leper says to Jesus is, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This leper had heard that Jesus had the authority and the power to heal the sick. He was in no doubt that Jesus could cleanse him. But that doubt was there. That if was there. If you are willing, you can make me clean. You know, there are many people around the world today who can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They can hear the good news that Jesus Christ has borne the punishment for our sin. They can hear the good news that Jesus is in the business of forgiving us our sin. They can hear the good news that we can receive everlasting life through Jesus Christ, that we can be guaranteed a place in heaven through Jesus Christ. They can know this truth. Some people call it the news that is true too good to be true and yet the good news is that this this good news is true but so many people think that they have fouled up so much they've done so much wrong they've let so many people down they have hurt so many people they have done so much that is opposed to god's holy standards of righteousness they've done so much that they consider evil that they consider wicked maybe they've done it deliberately and come to regret it they've come to to feel that terrible remorse for the things they have done maybe they have been coerced into it maybe simply through them their circumstances they have been forced to to do things that they would not have wanted to do. Many women around the world have been trafficked into prostitution. It's not their choice and yet they are living with the appalling shame of having to give their bodies to men for money in order simply to feed their children or to stop their minders beating them because they haven't raised enough. There are people around this world today who have been abused and who have been made to feel like it's their fault. There are people around this world who have murdered for money. There are people around this world that have done all sorts of appalling things. And the question in their heart is, I know that Jesus can save me. I know that Jesus can forgive me. I know that Jesus can give me everlasting life. But the question is, is he willing? When he looks at what I've done, when he sees the appalling things that I have done, when he sees these things that I feel so guilty about, have I been so bad that Jesus will not extend his compassion and his forgiveness toward me? I remember seeing a man years ago on the streets of Slovakia, in floods of tears, sobbing his heart out as he heard the gospel, as he heard that Jesus could forgive him his sin. This man's story was that he had been involved in the genocides in Serbia and Bosnia Herzegovina back in the 80s. And on one occasion, his commanding officer had pulled a family out in front of him father, mother, children. And his commanding officer had said to him, shoot these people. And he'd refused. He'd said, no, I'm not going to do that. They are innocent. I refuse to do it. The commanding officer had turned his gun on this man and said, if you don't shoot them, I will. But I will shoot you first. And this man, in fear for his own life, had shot down this innocent family, parents and children, and he'd never been able to forgive himself. He lived with that image in his mind's eye ever since of them begging him for their lives. And yet he had gunned them down rather than be killed himself. And that man stood there, unable to believe that Jesus would 
forgive him. He knew Jesus could, but he found it so hard to believe that Jesus would forgive him. How many of us are like this leper, that we see the things we've done and we think Jesus would never forgive me for that? Why would he forgive me for that? Why would he forgive me? Why would he cleanse me after what I've done and what I've become? That is the cry of so many human hearts. And yet see what Jesus does. Verse 41. It says, Then Jesus moved with compassion. This is the response of the heart of Jesus to those of us who consider ourselves unclean. This is the response of Jesus to anyone who will call upon his name. This is the response of anyone who comes to Jesus humbly as this leper does and says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The response of Jesus is not to condemn them. The response of Jesus is not to cast them away. The response of Jesus is not to pick up a stone and hurl it. The response of Jesus is moved with compassion. Compassion is such a powerful thing. This is not just pity. This is not just feeling sorry. Compassion is something that comes from our very guts. He is literally moved in his innermost being with compassion for this man. Whatever you have done, if you will call upon Jesus, he will answer with one thing and one thing only, compassion, compassion. Jesus will offer you compassion. He will not turn you away. He will not stone you. He will not condemn you. He will not run from you. He will do what he did for this leper. It tells us that Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him. Jesus will reach out his hand and touch you. You're not untouchable to Jesus. Jesus isn't scared of what you've done. Jesus isn't put off by how bad you've been or how bad you feel you've been. Jesus has only one response. It is the response of compassion. And Jesus does the very thing that the leper would never have expected him to do. The leper was probably expecting Jesus to speak a word and for him to receive his cleansing. But Jesus does something. He demonstrates his compassion. He does the one thing that nobody would ever do. He reaches out and he touches the leper. That touch confirmed to the leper that Jesus was willing. Jesus will never just say, I am willing. Jesus will always confirm it. If you come to Jesus, no matter what you have done, if you call upon Jesus, if you come to Jesus humbly and you say, Jesus, if you are willing, I know I've messed up. I know I've really made a mess of things. I've been bad. I've been rotten through and through. I've hurt so many people. I've done so much that is wrong. Lord, I am so sorry. I don't know. I, I don't know how to get myself out of this mess. I can't get myself out of this mess. Jesus, I know you can. But Lord, are you willing? Jesus will reach out his hand and touch even you. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you have done, Jesus will reach out his hand and touch you. How do you know that? You know that because Jesus did something which only God could ever conceive. Mankind was lost in sin. Mankind is lost in sin. You only have to look around the world to see the appalling state of this world. You see the rise in violent crime. You see murder. You see war. You see rape. You see abuse. You see so many things that just seem to be getting more and more and more and more and more. God would have had every right to just write mankind off, to just say, forget it. They, they've just, no, they're too far gone. But God didn't do that. God became man. Jesus Christ 
we know the accounts from the nativity that Jesus Christ was born of Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of Mary. He became a human being with the name Jesus Christ. He lived the perfect life. He lived a life that was free from sin. He showed what life free from sin really is. And yet, sinful men took him and nailed him to a cross. But that was all God's plan. God touched sinful man with his presence on earth when he came as Jesus Christ. But then he demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. While we were still sinners, God didn't tell us, you've got to get your act cleaned up first. God didn't say to us, how can I accept you as you are? God didn't say to us, no, forget it. God said, I see your plight. God said, I see the state of the world. God said, I see the mess that mankind is in. I see that there is no hope for mankind as things are. And he came and he left behind the glory of heaven. He left behind the place where he, had, where he enjoys the worship of angels night and day. He left behind that place and came into this sinful world. And then he laid down his life as he took the punishment that our sins deserve. Your sin, my sin. He took the punishment for it all. There is no sin so tiny that Jesus didn't deal with it. But let me tell you, there is no sin so great that the blood of Jesus cannot wash you clean. There is no sin so great that it cannot be forgiven. Jesus paid the price for it all. So if you're asking the same question the leper asked, are you willing? Then Jesus says, I've already reached out my hand. I've already shown you that I am willing. So if you really want me to make you clean, then yes, be clean. That's what Jesus is saying to you today. No matter how far you've fallen, no matter how bad things have been, no matter how wretched your life has become, no matter how terrible the things you might have done, Jesus says, I am willing. Be clean. You have to simply come to him and ask him, forgive me. Lord, will you forgive even me? And Jesus says, yes, I am willing. Be clean. No matter what you've done, come to Jesus today. Only Jesus can do this. It is only Jesus who went to the cross for you. You can't clean yourself up. The leper was unable to make himself clean. The leper was unable to get himself back into a place where he could be welcomed again into society. The leper was unable to bring himself into a place again where he could approach God. He had to come to Jesus and he had to receive cleansing from Jesus. Leprosy is like sin. Leprosy is the thing that excluded this man from the worship of God, from the presence of God, and sin excludes us from the presence of God. But the good news today, this good news that is almost too good to be true, is that if you will call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whoever, that includes you, no matter what you've done. So simply come today, say to Jesus, Lord, I know I can't do this myself. I've tried to do better. I've tried to put things right. I've tried to live a good life, but I've failed. I can't shake the guilt, I can't shake the shame, I can't shake these feelings, I can't shake this uncleanness. Lord Jesus, will you make me clean 
today? Will you make me fit for heaven today? Will you forgive my sin today? If that's you, then simply call on Jesus. Simply pray, Jesus, I can't do this by myself. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I am what the Bible calls a sinner. In myself, I have no hope of heaven. In myself, I have no hope of forgiveness. But Jesus, I know that you are the Son of God. I know that you died on the cross for me. And I ask you, Jesus, the one who is risen from the dead, to save me, to cleanse me, to forgive me my sin, and to give me the gift of everlasting life that only you can give. If that's you today, if you've prayed that prayer today and you've really meant it, then Jesus will have heard your cry and he will have saved you because he loves you, because he has compassion on you, and because his blood cleanses from all sin. If you've prayed that prayer today and meant it, then I simply want to ask you to do something. First of all, tell somebody what you have done. Tell a friend, tell a relative, tell somebody you know who's already a Christian, tell someone. Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Jesus died publicly for you. So be public in being a Christian. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian because Jesus is not ashamed to call you now his brother, his sister. Get hold of a Bible. If you don't already have one, get hold of one. Get hold of a, a translation that you find easy to read. I would recommend the New King James Version. Some people prefer the New International Version. But get hold of a version of the Bible that you find easy to read. And begin to read. I would recommend just begin with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And find a church. Find a church somewhere where, but the, where they believe. That what the Bible says, where they preach what the Bible says, and people there will help you and encourage you and pray with you and, and bless you and, uh, and be there for you as you grow in this new life with Jesus Christ. Please get in touch with us as well. Let us know what you've done and we will pray for you. We will pray with you if that's what you would like. But please get in touch with somebody and let them know. God bless you as you begin this new life in Jesus Christ as you leave behind that old man that old woman whatever they've done they're dead now they died with Christ and you have received everlasting life in Jesus and ask Jesus to fill you with his Holy Spirit the gift that Jesus promised to those who believe in him God bless you God bless you bye bye